Hi everyone, Spider-Man1991 here to talk about my comics for the week of November 2nd, 2011. Okay, let's kick the review off with Invincible, number 84. Okay, the story takes pl for this issue takes place in Las Vegas, right? Well, at least in this universe where Las Vegas used to be because it was destroyed by a supervillain named Dinosaurus. And now... Uh, the city's gone, and in its place is just a huge uh, sheet of glass. Well, clear, well, reflective glass. And anyways, uh, basically, Cecil's department and stuff. Ha Cecil, who's Invincible's fr uh, sort of friend in the government and stuff. Well, the super main superhero contact in the government. He also gets his department to build solar panels all across the plane and he shows it to Invincible and tells him that even though they're not going to rebuild the city they're still using it to build some solar panels and here's the interesting thing the solar panels are double sided so this way they can use the reflect reflection of the light off the glass to help to include more energy so it will be a cleaner cheaper source of energy for half the country and of course this ma makes Invincible think that wait a minute dinosaur this was what dinosaurs kind of wanted but he was sort of right and anyways, after that, Mark, Invincible, or Mark, that's his real name, he goes to talk to Eve, and he says that he thinks he's figured out a way to help the world without having to be a superhero, without having to go and punch bad guys or, you know, hold up bridges or something. He's figured, and he tells her that he, in order to do that, though, he's going to have to do something that seems really bad, but he wants to know if she can tr trust him, and she says she's okay with it. So then we cut to prison, Invincible goes to see Dinosaurus, and Dinosaurus... And Invincible basically tells him, makes him a deal, says that Dinosaurus ha does have good intentions with the big picture and all, but he wants to make, but he wants to help Dinosaurus only to make sure that Dinosaurus doesn't kill anyone, anyone innocent or anyone at all while trying to make the world a better place. So basically, Dinosaurus and Invincible kind of make a partnership, then Invincible breaks him out of prison, and at that point Cecil get, catches catches it on the security cameras, and he decides, all right, that's it, Invincible's a fugitive, and he tells Eve that if Mark contacts her and she hasn't reported, then she's going to be named an accomplice. And the last page is Invincible and Dinosaurus. At Dinosaurus' lair, Invincible says, okay, let's save the world. All right, well, that is definitely a new direction for Invincible. Now he's actually working... With the way Mark... For the past two issues, they've all... They've been teasing with the... Uh, they've been getting the idea in Mark's head that he can do good things for the world by not... There are more ways to save the world than just dressing up in a superhero costume and fighting bad guys because he can do other things. And and now this book is an option that no one really thought of because I figured he might just give up being invincible and maybe do something else. But now he's working with one of the bad guys. Well, I wouldn't say Dinosaurus is a bad guy. More of just a misdirection vision Mary and he basically so now he's working with dinosaurs just to make sure no one gets hurt and they can make the world a better place I mean it's an interesting new direction for the book though uh, I think it's really something no one saw coming I mean invincible working with the bad guy but it really looks interesting it makes me look forward to future issues of this um, next issue though for Invincible, we are going to move away from Earth and go back to, I think, the the main center of the United Planets, where we're going to have some stories featuring Invincible's dad, Omni-Man, and his brother, Kid o Oliver Kid Omni-Man. Or is it Young Omni-Man? I don't know. Anyway, so after this issue, we're going to take a little break from Mark's story and go to go a story featuring, his, featuring the rest of his family with his dad and his bro little brother. Alright, but still, Invincible was definitely a good read, and I really look forward to the rest of the series. Okay, now, Avengers Academy, number 21. The new West Avengers Academy has moved to the West Coast, and even though they're opening all their doors to every single young superhuman who wants to learn stuff, um, only seven, only a few students are going to be full, are going to be there full-time. Everyone else is just going to be part-time. And the full-time students are the regulars we've had in Adventures Academy since the beginning, minus Vale because she quit. 
and two new and sort of two new characters to the team, uh, White Tiger and someone you may know from the Power Pack, Lightspeed. Uh, her brother is Alex Power, and he's on the FF. Anyways, what happens in Avengers Academy 21? Um, well, with Speedball, also with Speedball and Justice leave, left the faculty last issue, Hawkeye has joined the full-time faculty. So, now the faculty consists of Giant Man, Tigra, Quicksilver, and Hawkeye. And also, this issue, though, after the team gets introduced to their new members and, and they find out Hawkeye's on the faculty, Quicksilver discovers that Jocasta was murdered. And, I mean, she was... When I say murder, I mean her body was destroyed and her entire mind was wiped from the systems, computers, and every Avenger database. And Quicksilver mentions that all the security footage was turned off, so it must have been someone on the inside. Then we cut to Reptile sort of, talk, sort of talking to himself, saying that he's found, he's reached a tipping point and that the future will be ours. And apparently, this is the twist here. Uh, teenage Reptile... You may remember back in, back right before Fear Itself uh, in Avengers Academy, they met Korvac, and in order to fight Korvac, they had to put their mind, their present minds and their adult self bodies. Well, apparently Reptile's adult self has returned in his teenage body, while, Reptile, while present day Reptile's mind is trapped in his adult body in the future, which is imprisoned by, uh, all, by his teammates by the future members of the Avengers Academy, with Vale included. I think I sound really confusing, but yeah. Basically what happens is future Reptile and present-day Reptile just mind-swapped. So, yeah. And now apparently, and from what I'm getting from the ending, is that apparently the kids in Avengers Academy did become supervillains in that future. But here's the thing, though. Future might change for them. Uh, Avengers Academy 21 was definitely a good jumping-on point now, if you haven't been reading this series, I would recommend starting now. Uh, this is kind of funny how they put right here, uh, first issue of a new era. It just seems a little... It's funny, but... Still, it, nice introduction to the West Coast campus. Uh, we've got two new members which look at, who look interesting. And... Yeah, a definitely good hook ending there that I think... That I think will be good. That long-time readers of this book will really appreciate. But um, other, but newer readers though might be a little confused. So still, I would definitely re recommend picking this up. Uh, all right, now for Amazing Spider-Man six seventy-three, the epilogue to Spider Island. The Avengers are basically cleaning, are at the cleanup site, taking care of uh, Spider Queen's corpse. When, and apparently we're also revealed that Jackal is still alive. Yeah, I know he was killed by the Queen a few issues ago, but apparently that was a clone. Seriously, what is, it? What is with clones? I, they just make things more confusing. Anyways, Jackal's alive. He took some of the Queen's DNA and left without anyone knowing. And also, Peter goes off to the airport. He sees Aunt May and, Aunt May and her husband Jay off, and they fly to Boston. And Peter, and as Peter's leaving the airport, he runs. Kane meets up with him there, and Kane says that he spoke with Madame Web, and he's decided that he should go go leave New York and kind of find his own own place to be a hero and stuff. And then Peter asks, "Say, can I have my suit back?" And Kane says, "No, Madame Web says I might need it. I'm holding on to it." So there goes the Sonic Spidey suit. After the airport, Peter returns back to his apartment where he meet where Carly's there, and she breaks up with him because she's figured out he's Spider-Man. Yeah, not only is she dumping him, but she figured out he's Spider-Man. How, you ask? Well, apparently she noticed that Peter was probably the only person not struggling with spider powers during Spider Island. So, so kind of, so Peter kind of gave himself away with that, but she was pissed at him for lying. She's basically pissed at him for lying. And now she's just decided to end their relationship there. So, all I can say about that is, yay! <laughs> There's, I think a lot of people are, it seems like it would be sad, but I think a lot of people are now happy that he broke up with Carly, and it does seem like Dan Slott's pushing MJ and Peter back together. Oh yeah, then after the breakup scene, Peter goes and tries to speak to Doctor, and speaks to Doctor Strange about how Carly knew, and apparently when Peter went on the internet 
uh, at the very beginning of Spider Island and encouraged New Yorkers to use their powers for good. Um, he kind of revealed himself to the world, and that weakened the spell he put Doctor Strange used to wipe out Peter's identity. So, basically, no one remembers, and everyone who did know uh, still doesn't remember, but that doesn't mean... That means Peter is no longer protected. So his identity is safe, but it can still be learned. I don't even know how that works. I mean, I think the spell pretty much fixed it so that Peter's identity wouldn't be learned, but I guess unless Peter reveals it, but now uh, anyone can learn it, so Peter now has to be extra careful. Anyway, skipping that crap. Uh, Peter goes, then goes to Horizon Labs. He gets a vial of spider formula. And as he's leaving, as Spider-Man, he runs to Madam Web, and Madam Web tells him that uh, she can sort of congratulate, congratulates him on defeating the Queen, and then she says that uh, you you will soon experience a great loss, which leaves Peter a little worried. Then he finds MJ, and he gives MJ the cure before her before the virus in her can advance any further, and she becomes a giant spider. So MJ was the last person cured, and that's the end of Spider Island. And the final scene, though, is Peter and MJ sort of talking about everything, and then then they both MJ point, points to the Empire State Building, and it's and it's illuminated in red and blue lights, and it's and MJ says it's kind of a way of New York saying thank you to Spider Man. So yeah, okay, this was a very nice epilogue. A lot of I think a lot of people are going to be very happy with the whole with, now that Peter and Carly are broken up, and it seems like uh, Peter and MJ are sort of getting closer to being back together, I guess. And what else? What else? Oh, yeah. Spider Island itself was an amazing story. If you have not read this at all, definitely wait a few months until the hardcover comes out, then get it. It was. It's definitely worth it. I am really glad I have all the issues of this. It was a truly amazing story, and I really hope Dan Slott can continue the awesomeness of that is going on in Amazing Spider-Man. Okay, last thing, last comic from DC, Action Comics, number three. All right, issue opens up with a brief sort of flashback to the days of Krypton with Kal-El as a baby, and apparently Krypton's under attack by some, by all of its, te by some technological entity, which I'm guessing is Brainiac. Well, I'm, a, I'm actually 90% sure it's Brainiac. Anyways, Brainiac takes control of all the technology and all the service drones and stuff. And then jor is contacting Lara, telling her to get out of Candor immediately. Something's going to happen. And Lara and Baby Kal get out of there just in time. And apparently Candor is surrounding this big, huge green light thing, which I'm assuming Brainiac's either going to destroy or shrink Candor. And basically, and now we cut back to present day Earth, and apparently it's Clark waking up, so this must have been some sort of dream type memory he's been experiencing. Anyways, Clark wakes up, and the police sort of raid his apartment, search his apartment for any evidence that's linking him with Superman. Fortunately, they don't find anything. And also, the, uh, the rich guy, uh, the businessman Superman, sort of went after, uh, in issue one, Glenn, Glenn Morgan. Uh, he's now pretty much gone, uh, televised a press conference stating that he now has evidence that Superman is an alien. And hearing the revelation has caused the people of Metropolis to turn against Superman. They basically uh, fi find out he's an alien. They think he's a menace and tell, pretty much tell him to go back to where he came from and stuff. So with Superman sort of hated in the public eye, the only thing Clark can do now to sort of fight... Uh, corruption in Metropolis is by sticking to his day job, to his job as a reporter for apparently the Daily Star, Star, which is a nice little homage to the Golden Age, because that was actually the original paper that Superman worked for before they changed it, the name of it to the Daily Planet, and also the editor of the Daily Star is George Taylor, who's also the editor back in the Golden Age, again before they changed it to Perry White, and again that's mentioned in this issue. Again, a lot of stuff in action. They do reference the Golden Age a lot, which is pretty cool. Anyways, back to the story. Anyways, Clark's best best weapon now is just to use the power of the press to fight corruption. And while he's working on the story, he runs into Jimmy and Lois at the same place at this sort of robot automated factory 
Then, all of a sudden, the technology in the factory starts getting possessed and controlled by the same entity that attacked Krypton in Clark's sort of dream. Anyways, it sort of starts taking control, saying it's going to conquer the world, saying it's going to take all the knowledge of the planet or something. And meanwhile, back at the military compound from issue two, John Corbin, John Corbin is about to go through the soldier steel process, but then all of a sudden the entity sort of possesses John Corbin while he's going through the process, and now the entity sort of has a physical form. And then Lex Luthor speaks up saying, yes, I'm Lex Luthor. I believe we had a bargain. And then the, then the possessed Corbin says, bring me super." basically says, where is Superman? Bring him to me. So, that's where our action ends. Uh, well, not really excited for this as it was in issue two, but good news is we did get some sort of insight as to what Krypton looked like in the new 52. Weird thing about Crypto, though, they designed Crypto to look like a cross between a dog and a, a wolf or a tiger. No, wait, he looks more like a wolf, though. It's Crypto looks like he's still white-furred, but he looks like a cross between a dog and a, and a wolf. It, it just looks really strange. And again, the entity, entity taking control of Krypton and Earth's technology, uh, I really think it's... I'm pretty sure it's Brainiac, okay? The ship from issue two, the whole control and the attack on Kandor, it's definitely Brainiac. I mean, come on, you the signs are there. It it's pretty cl it's mostly clear. It does seem like the obvious direction, but we'll but we can't be be sure yet. I mean I'm ninety percent sure it's Brainiac. I'm not a hundred percent. But still, I'm I am I'm actually enjoying action comics a lot more than Superman right now, because it's written by Grant Morrison. I I do love Grant Morrison. He's a great writer, but eh. and it's really interesting how he's kind of doing several homages to the Golden Age, like with the Daily Star and stuff. Oh, interesting thing in this issue too. Jimmy says that apparently Lois is on her way to sort of because they wanted to offer Clark a position at the Daily Planet, but Clark didn't want to take it because the planet's owned by uh, the same businessman who's saying that Superman's an alien. Even though we all know it's true. Uh, it's just pretty much making every single person tur in Metropolis turn against their once beloved hero. But again, this is five years ago. Something must have changed to make the people realize that he's a good guy, which I'm pretty sure we'll get to soon. Uh, Action Comics is still pretty good, although between this and Superman, I would definitely go with Action Comics. I'm still going to get both, but I prefer Action over Superman right now. Okay. That's my review for this week. Again, Action Comics number three. Still, uh, this issue wasn't very exciting as the last issue, but hey, it's a little better than Superman. Amazing Spider-Man 673, the epilogue to the amazing story of Spider Island. Very awesome series. Can't wait to see what Dan Slott has next. Avengers Academy number 21. Great jumping on point if you haven't been reading this series, although the ending might be confusing to new readers. Really do the new West Coast direction is a great move. And Invincible number 84. Invincible did something that most people probably thought he'd never do, but hey, it still looks like an interesting issue. Still makes me look forward to the rest of this series. And that's all I have to say. Uh, Spider-Man 1991 scene. See you later.